I built it. Uh, here is a uh, Campagnolo EPS multifunctional something um, derailleur controller. I, I guess this is, is the term I'm going to go with. Uh, it's actually been a long road and uh, I've got more to show you than is in this video, but I figured it's been a while. So I just kind of want to go over the basics of how do I get to this and this doing sort of shift it. First things first, uh, PCBs. So uh, last I talked about, about the design and stuff, and then I actually, I just went and I designed it and ordered it. After I got the boards, I bought a new reflow oven, and then I had to immediately take it apart, do a bunch of upgrades to make it work decently. For the upgrades, it's pretty decent. Not great with uh, any plastic connectors on top and uh, stuff. So I'm still working on that. So now it's a lot better uh, and a lot safer. I decided to use actually use the pick and place this time because um, it just takes a lot of time to do it by hand. And, and if I do want to, you know, make some changes with this board, it's, it's nice to have them all set up and just throw on the reels. And eh, it's about halfway full now. And yeah, it just sucks to swap out reels. I've got a whole bunch of 402 reels not installed. But the 402s had me dial in the system really well. And so once I got everything set up for the boards, it dropped everything really accurately in place. It was, it was just probably the smoothest time running that machine I've ever had. Frankly, honestly, uh, lack thereof. And that, that was really on me. So board bring up, normally you would have some code that you can test on it and test your chips and do some basic stuff. I didn't have any of that. So I did the basics, uh, add power to the board, mm, found out two had some sort of weird short to ground. One was bad, one was actually still functional, but I couldn't find the short. The other uh, thing that I, I could do is once I had, it, had that figured out, I could check uh, the DC to DC regulator that just powers up automatically. It's ultra efficient. So three volts there, great. The next thing, just throw on some, any old BLE code um, because that, that debugs so many things. The only things then I needed to start really figuring out is motor controller interface. Uh, I have written drivers for the accelerometer before, but I don't really care about that just yet. And getting the hull effect and stuff sorted out. So that leads us on to drivers and some annoying terminology here, but it'll be useful to go over because longer term parts of this project need to be written very carefully in order to work properly. It's the difference between 10 hours of function and hundreds or thousands and thousands of shifts. Microcontrollers have all these peripherals and they're accessed through registers. And those, the code that kind of touches those registers is called the hardware ab abstraction layer. And that twiddles all the registers and controls things. You, you have a layer up from that that's usually what you call your driver. So your SPI driver, your I2C driver, your PWM driver. And sometimes they're not really drivers, they're actually libraries uh, because like you can build a PWM out of timers and uh, what's called peripheral, peripheral interconnects and stuff. So that's all kind of that layered down. Then we still have other drivers where we use SPI to talk to something, or we use PWM to control something, or we use UART or I2C. And that's kind of the drivers that area that I'm initially building. Those initial drivers have to be written in a very specific way to save power. And I've come up with a couple main methods of dealing with this, but the, the highlighted example is if I turn on an SPI bus to say talk to the accelerometer, that's burning 0.3 milliamps constantly, even if I'm not talking on it. 
So this is why you need to to be very conscientious of what's on. So I mean, I, I can basically turn on three SPI peripherals and you're at the limit of what you can do with a coin cell battery. You're not transmitting, you're not processing, you're not doing anything, and you're already at a milliamp. So you need to take these things into consideration and because the motor takes so much power, um, you really need to be conscientious. So the two methods I've built are one really relying on what's called uh, DMA, direct memory access, or as Nordic calls it, easy DMA. It's a very simplified way of basically you don't, in normal controllers, if you're using an Arduino, you will say, you know, you are do this transfer or I squared C or wire as they call it, do this transfer. And then you set it up, you queue everything, and, and your processor is immediately blocked. It is halted for, uh, to use an incorrect term. It is just waiting there, doing nothing until that command completes. It's great. You wrote one line of code, send this, send this data to this bus, I'll wait for some to come back or something, and you don't have to do a thing, but your processor is blocked. And when your processor is blocked, it is running at maximum power. So you don't want to do that. Instead, Nordic's Easy DMA allows you to queue up everything in the registers for the peripheral. Remember that hardware extract, abstraction layer. You send set up everything, and it twiddles everything, and it gets ready. And that peripheral will run fully, absolutely, totally, automatically, independently of the processor. And the processor can just go to sleep or get on with other things. The trade-off is. If you need that for the next step of your program, you have to kind of build a weight in there or you have to have a way of it re-enabling to where it was. Or uh, I, I kind of use uh, little um, functions that run kind of as in sort of a pseudo terribly written schedule type thing. So the idea is they queue up the next action because when that function is done, it triggers another interrupt, wakes the processor back up and it can get back on with stuff. Or if the processor's busy, it interrupts it and it can do stuff. But you don't want to do all your processing there because it can cause some real issues. So you want to back in main, so you want to try and set flags and stuff. So what basically turned from one line of code in Arduino or even STM land, like it turns into 15, 20, 30, 50. Um, because then on top of that, I like to build, well, when I need to do the SPI transfer, I have to turn on the SPI bus. And then when the transfer is complete, I shut it down. And you know, if you're only using 4%, again, that's 0.3 milliamps, 300 microamps. But if you're only using 4%, it averages out to 12 microamps and that's so much better. And for this, we need every little ounce of power. And so we have to be very, very, very careful. And so starting to write the code has to be kind of keeping in mind all those things because adding them after the fact to your interface drivers, it's really, really hard. It's just so incredibly hard to go in there and rewrite everything to, to add this one little kind of simple feature and so easy to screw it up. Then if you, you build out from that, it, it's a lot simpler. And so a little bit of rewriting later, it's actually really simple now to make it work. And I thought it was gonna be much, much harder with the contrived Nordic drivers. So uh, very glad about that one, uh, super simple. Um, you can use it you know, with most of these drivers out there from uh, microchip and probably analog and a lot of the TI parts that are doing, doing brushed motors with this. Like now I, I have a, uh, something that's simple and easy to use set up for everything. The next thing to tackle, motor position. Well, EPS does things differently. It actually has Hall effects on the output shaft. And as you can see, it's kind of a screw jack. And so while that's good in some ways, it means that I have, you know, 10 turns that I can use. And I, if I have 0.1 or let's, let's be realistically, 0 0.5, 0 0.8 degree angular accuracy. So it's a good mechanism. I've heard 
not as efficient as, as a direct gear train mechanism, but it, it doesn't, it's very hard to back drive, so you don't usually get position losses. But those Hall effects are old school. They are like three milliamps each. That's not gonna cut it, but they run into some filters to clean them up and then into the ADC. It took 500 microseconds to start up these things. So if I wanted to duty cycle them, it was wasting a lot of power. And so after a lot of fooling around, I went and I uh, just removed the caps, brought them down from uh, 0.1 microfarad or 100 nanofarads down to 10 nanofarads. So now they're basically the startup time is one tenth. And uh, that got me down to uh, 50 microseconds and I can build a delay into the ADC and uh, it worked out great. You now know where the motor is. Uh, assume I'm counting rotations, I, I am. And I have a motor dr output driver thing that will me allow me to control the motor with fold and to very little power in both directions. Uh, I need a control loop. Well, and when I say control loop, I mean the idea is we measure the angle and compare it to the target. And so that's the easiest way of doing this is, is what's called PID, proportional integral derivative gains. So you, you find your, your error over time, you find the change in your error, and they all have different gains as well as just your error. They're all for different things. There's hundreds of videos that cover that. Um, I tried a couple of different methods of tuning them and kind of happy, but I'm not gonna cover that now. If you wanna learn more about PID, there's 80,000 videos out there. I guess that leads into Bluetooth low energy. Well. I'm just using this, uh, the Nordic UART interface because uh, lots of apps out there use it. I've used this for a bunch of projects. I basically have a simplified command structure for letters and numbers and floats and dabbing and decoding. Later on, I'll write a custom characteristic to basically do upshift, downshift. So that when, it, when I have to com configure the shifters to whatever they connect to, um, or the buttons into the auxiliary jack, It'll be really, really simple to, you know, of a command structure, won't have all these extra features or overhead. One of the things that I've been working on is a video talking about exiting consumer sales. And people will have seen probably that I shut down my company's Shopify store. Um, it's still working on stuff behind the scenes, but Frankly, uh, consumer sales, it's just not worth it. It doesn't make us any money um, at those volume. But one of the things I loathe in that video is my loss of a platform to share. And when I say share, not just videos, but share like someone out there may find this derailleur system useful. The fact that, oh, they might want to change between an 11 and 12 speed wheels or um, they might want to, you know, modify their derailleur to do um, something else, you know, and they need a controller for it. And, you know, that's great, uh, but beyond sharing videos and, and, and the open source world, giving your work away for free and people not abiding by your, your licenses, I don't really have a platform. And so I've been thinking uh, a bit more about Patreon as a platform in order to get rewards, as in, you know, if you, you know, you're three months, four months, six months in, and you're like, oh, you've, you've reached a certain number of milestone, then you now have covered the cost of, of an EPX controller board. Oh, so I can ship one out to you. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea. I talk a little bit more about it in that video if I ever get around to releasing it. But if you do think it's a good idea or a bad idea, let me know. Um, I really would love any feedback or if you have other ideas for that. With that, uh, yeah, hopefully it won't take me so long to get the next one out, but no guarantees because you never know how life goes. With that, thanks for watching.